Yeah. I'm going to have to hook up the owl. All right. Are you ready? This is to hear it. We got it. You got it? Okay, we got it. Now let's see what happens. Can I say it again? Okay. Happy Sabbath, Stephen Nelly, Sandy. Happy Sabbath. Let's see, I think we have time just for a few prayer requests. We'll put those on the board. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. We're on an alternate computer today because our internet is down. Oh, I see. It's working. <laughs> yeah, we can see you, so we'll be fine. Right. Well, talk again, Steve, just in case. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> Petitions and praises. Blue sky. I like that song. Blue sky is smiling at me. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but blue skies. You know that song? You ought to see. Vincent, uh, you are here. Who? Yeah. Oh, they are? <clears throat> They're not here today? Well, they might be here today. I just know that Sunday they're traveling. Oh, they're traveling this coming week. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. I got mixed up, Vincent. And also for my grandma because she traveled on Monday. The name is Maria. Maria is traveling on Monday. Okay. <laughs> one in. Okay, one in. Oh, in a way. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Just call her Nelly for sure. That's what I need to yes. do. I don't know why. Yeah. 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 I don't know why. Well, I can't keep it straight. Okay. What the, the Bailey family, they're, they're from the Bell Lab Assembly Church. Oh, really? They're from the Church. I need to have uh, radiation on my liver. Oh, Sandy, really? So you got the results from your scan, I'm assuming. Yeah, everything else is good, but uh, my uh, liver has, uh, cancer has doubled in size. We're going to pray for healing uh, for her liver. Run. Drive through prayer yesterday. We got. Uh, we have this lady. She's uh, trying to get here every weekend. Uh, she brought a friend two weeks ago by the name of Angie, and Angie was so pleased. They laid it with the prayers we had for her that when um, the other lady that brought her when she came back yesterday, she just told us all about it. And she couldn't bring her friend Angie yesterday because she's Angie's on her way to Kentucky, and oh, she'll she'll be back in, in a couple weeks. So, you know that that's good. And Angie, she's been coming just, just about every week and giving donations. 
that we turn into the church. I'm going to put Angie here, and then we want to remember Monty and Celeste. Sandra. Sandra and Richard. I like to, you know, I've been praying to thank the church for the flowers and the prayer. I think it's awesome, Tina. It is awesome. I um, actually started a new job. Oh, uh, this is a huge praise report. I will be on call once every month. So I can come to the church <laughs> with my family like I need to be. So that's really wonderful. I'm doing a home health, home health job. So Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Yes. It's fabulous. What a relief. Oh, it's a huge relief. Any other praises or prayer requests? Pray for Jason. He's a little under the weather. That's why oh, he's not really? here today. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna Brother David Dodson is gonna join our church today. Yeah, Chris and Amber made it. Wonderful. It's good to see you all. So not only have recently, uh, let's see, it was, what's it been now? Uh, it's almost two weeks, right? Yeah. And they were remodeling a house before that. So, I mean, that's kind of a lot of stress, right? The house and then the wedding and wow. So, are you through with remodeling? No, we're about three to eight months out. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so we're going to have Larry and Joy uh, come every other month? Just about well, every month, really. Yeah. Well, that'd be good. Just have to move up here. Might as well just move up here. That'd be awesome. All right, you ready to pray? We'll get started. Father in heaven, we do praise you and thank you for a beautiful Sabbath morning, beautiful blue skies. We thank you for the birds and for just this opportunity to come and worship you on the Sabbath day. And Father, we thank you for drive through prayer and the people coming through and the impact it's making in people's lives. We thank you. Uh, for comforting Robert's family with the passing of his brother. We ask that you please continue to do so. Thank you for Tina's new job and David Dodson uh, joining our church today. And we just want to lift up the Blanzies and Maria for traveling. Mercy's coming this week. And the Bailey family uh, had a family member pass away. We pray for the Holy Spirit to comfort them. We just want to lift up Sandy Sanders in a special way and pray healing for her liver. Uh, we're going to have some radiation to kill the cancer cells, and we pray for eradication of these cancer cells, Father. Please intervene. We thank you, God, again for drive through prayer. We want to lift up Angie, who's been coming through, and her friend. We want to pray for Monty and Celeste, and just, uh, just pray for their health, Father. Be with Sandra and Richard and the struggles they're going through, Jason for healing. And Father, we just pray for each one of us, for the Holy Spirit to fill us, to teach us, as we open the word of God this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> you got it? I wonder who's having a prayer today. <laughs> he has it. I think Jeremy has it, doesn't he? Yeah, so you got it. As soon as John Barwell gets here, we'll get started. Oh, hey, John! <laughs> Excellent. All right, so we are in the book of Daniel. We've almost made it to Daniel chapter 5. Any questions 
concerning Daniel chapter 5 before we jump into our study today. All right, in Daniel chapter 5, if you remember, this is, uh, anybody know the date of Daniel chapter 5? Okay, close. Yes, it's 539 BC, right? Because we're at the end of the Babylonian reign, right? And anybody know the month in 539 BC that we're in here? It is October. That's exactly right. October of 539 BC, and uh, the Medes and the Persians are outside the city walls of the city of Babylon. And in this particular case, um, they're trying to figure out how to get in, and they've been working on a plan, and we'll discuss that here in a few minutes. Uh, and, and it must be that the Babylonians, for some strange reason, didn't notice the plan that the Medes and the Persians were implementing. And uh, what's also strange about this, too, is this plan was prophesied in the Bible about 150 years before. And I know that Daniel had access to this and probably had already maybe warned Nebuchadnezzar that this is what the Bible says is going to happen. But Nebuchadnezzar had passed away. And now his grandson is in charge of Babylon at this point in time. And his grandson had turned away from the God of Nebuchadnezzar. If he would have stayed connected to the God of Nebuchadnezzar, he might have he would have seen the prophecy given in the book of Isaiah. We'll go there now, Isaiah chapter 44. And notice how accurate this prophecy was that Isaiah had shared that God gave him. Isaiah chapter 44, he's talking about Babylon. So at this point in time in Isaiah's life, Isaiah lived around 700 B.C., so Babylon wasn't even a world power at this time. Yet he's talking about, and God gave him information about the future, about the destruction of Babylon. And so <clears throat> here in Isaiah chapter 44, it says, and we'll look toward the end of the chapter, I love what it says in verse 24. Can somebody read that for us? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. Isn't it interesting how he calls himself our Redeemer? Right there in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 24. <clears throat> He's calling himself our Redeemer. And notice he also says he formed us in our mother's womb. Do you feel unique? I mean, think about what our irises, our, our fingerprints. Uh, I mean, can you uh, think about the billions of people? Nobody has exact same fingerprint. Nobody has exact same iris pattern. We're unique individuals. God formed us individually in our mother's womb. Our Redeemer. Isn't it? Are you blown away by that? Isn't it amazing? Think that little baby that just was born two weeks ago, right? Little Simon, formed by God himself in Shasta's womb. I just think it's wonderful. He's got a, he's got a plan for little Simon too, just like he has for us individually too. Anybody know in the Bible where it talks about God has a plan for each one of our lives and that he wrote it down? Yeah, Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. Do you mind reading that one, Bill? And uh, I don't know if, does somebody want to cut the air conditioner on and get it down below 120 in here? I don't know if there's anybody wants to do that. <laughs> Pastor, you said you were going to tell us where in Isaiah it said that. We're, we're getting right to it. We're almost there. Jeremiah. I just think. 29. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Look in Psalms 139. And let's start in verse 16 and 17. Somebody read that, please. Psalms 139, 16 and 17. 
What, what's amazing about what's happening here, and we're talking about Daniel chapter 5, Martin, and uh, the prophecy that God had given about Babylon being conquered by the Medes and the Persians about 150 years before it happened, okay? Really more than 150 years, but here we are around 700 B.C. We're in Isaiah chapter 44 and 45 right now. And it's interesting to me how he starts off this passage by saying, I'm your Redeemer, I'm the one that formed you in the womb. And then here we're going to read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And Psalms 139, 16 and 17. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! Wow. It's amazing to me. God, he knows every aspect of the future, doesn't he? He has planned even our own individual lives and written them down in the book and has a plan for each one of us. He forms us individually. He has a plan for us individually. He saves us individually. That's why he starts the passage off by calling himself our Redeemer. Don't you love that? David, our Redeemer. I think it's beautiful. Here we are in the Old Testament, too. And then he goes on to talk about what's going to happen to Babylon. He says in verse 26 of Isaiah 44, who confirms the word of his servant, performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited, to the cities of Judah, you shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places. Because what did Babylon do? They destroyed Jerusalem, right? In 586 B.C., they destroyed the city, they destroyed the temple, and they even they broke down the walls. They completely and utterly destroyed Jerusalem at that time. And then he goes on in verse 27 and talks about how the city of Babylon, who had conquered Jerusalem, was going to be destroyed. Because somebody read 27, 28, and then 45, verse 1. This saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. That saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure. He even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built. And to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two levit gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Notice, he goes on to talk about breaking in pieces the gates of bronze, so here is a prophecy of how, given by name, Cyrus, who wasn't even born yet, right? And Cyrus, he, he was a, uh, a Persian related to the Medes who eventually uh, brought together the Medes and the Persians and with their army together led the army to defeat the Babylonians in October of 539 B.C. And here Cyrus... He's called God's anointed, isn't he? Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. He calls him by name, right? Remember, he, he, he hadn't even been born yet. His father hadn't even been born yet. His grandfather hadn't even been born yet. And yet he calls this man by name and says, this is the man who's going to lead the army, and he's going to conquer the city of Babylon. Didn't Daniel, by the water yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Didn't Daniel point this out to him in this? I think Daniel tried, right? He pointed out to Cyrus. Yeah. I, yeah, he did point it out to Cyrus afterwards, right? right. But I think he tried. You know, I, I think he had the writings of Isaiah, and I think he showed Nebuchadnezzar this is ultimately what's going to happen, right? He might not have shown Nebuchadnezzar. Yet, you know, Belshazzar should have known this. Mm -hmm. But he didn't follow after the religion of his grandfather. He turned his back on the living true God and even committed blasphemy by using the articles from the temple that was destroyed in Jerusalem for alcoholic beverages and for uh, committing idolatry, right? 
And so here we have a prophecy given by God over 150 years before it came true, given by name of the man who's going to lead the army to conquer Babylon. And it says that he's going to redirect the river Euphrates. So in the city of Babylon, at that time, the river Euphrates went right through the city. So that's why Belshazzar and the people in Babylon, they had this wall. Chris, some parts of that wall were double wall or even so thick that you could have four chariots side by side all the way across the top of the wall. They didn't have any fear of the Babylonians uh, getting over or through the wall. And you know what? I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, the Medes and the Persians getting over or through the wall. So what did the Medes and the Persians do? They look at these walls and they say, you know, we're not going to get over or through these walls. But we could use the Euphrates River. And they redirected the Euphrates River. It lowered it down so low that they were able to go through and under the wall on the bed of the Euphrates River through these bronze gates that is talked about right here in Isaiah and then they were able to defeat the Babylonians from inside the city. I think it's so cool that if God can write a prophecy, and Isaiah write it down for us, he gave this prophecy to Isaiah, he wrote it down, 150 years before it happened, naming the person by name who's going to be doing this, doesn't God have a plan for each one of us? Doesn't God care about us as individuals? Do you see that, that God loves you that much? I mean, you're thinking, well, I can do that with billions of people on this earth. Well, he's God, right? You look at the stars. You don't see them running into each other and create havoc, do you? He's controlling. If he can do that, he can keep track of a billion people or seven billion people on this earth, can he? He has a plan for each one of us. He wants each one of us to experience eternal life. Can you give me a verse in the Bible? Because some people believed in... Uh, either once saved, always saved, or predestination. Can you give me a verse in the Bible that says that God doesn't want any to perish? That's exactly right. Where is that verse found? It's 2 Peter 3, 9. Let's hear, let somebody read 2 Peter 3, 9. It's not God's will that any should perish, but he's such a loving God that he allows us to have freedom of choice to exercise our own will to go against his will if it's our choice he's going to allow us to destroy ourselves even though it breaks his heart second peter 3 9 the lord is not slack concerning his promises some count slackness but is long suffering for us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Roberto, it's not God's will that any of us perish. Isn't that awesome? I love it when it's not God's will that we perish, right? That means it's his will that we have eternal life. I love that. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. First Timothy chapter two verse four. Somebody has that. She wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So all men, all mankind, he wants everybody to be saved, and all we have to do is allow Christ to save us, right? We are predestined to be saved. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Wanda. When we're talking about predestination, God doesn't arbitrarily determine, oh, you're going to be lost and you're going to be saved, right? He predestines all of us to be saved, and we choose to be lost. That's the sad part. It doesn't have to be that way, does it? It doesn't have to be that way. You know, Pastor, you brought up the Second Peter 3. The, the verses before that, it's this, this text where it says that a, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Yeah. The thing is, as I chew on that, we as Adventists, oh, God's going to come, he's going to come in the next couple of weeks, he's going to be here so any, any day, any minute, right, he's going, to, he's going to be here. But this, of course, explains why there's a delay, because, you know, uh, I'm reading in John in my personal devotions, and, and Jesus says, Jesus actually says, 
the timing of when I do things is important. It is important how I do things. He says, he tells these guys, but for you, it, it, it's not. You can go to Jerusalem any time, but for me, no. It matters. It matters, doesn't it? So it does matter, the timing. But the thing is, it's God's timing. And God's timing, I'm living and here to testify, is not mine. They are not the same That's true. thing. That's and true. My job is to sit back and relax and just let God take care of the time. Yeah. Trust. Because you're going to try to make sense of a, a thousand years being a day. Right. We can't. God, he just doesn't have that folding of time that we have. It's just not there. Yeah. That we can get into sci fi, can't we? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. I mean, this flat out says, well, uh, so you can go back in time a thousand years, calls people. You know, calls Jacob like he's alive. Because yeah, to God, yeah. he is. That's right. He calls, they're just asleep in the grave awaiting a resurrection. They're not really dead, right? The death takes place in the second death. Mark I wondered why God doesn't start talking about his coming as being soon until the, the New Testament. Yeah. Like when he talks to Daniel, it oh, to go your way, it's going to be. Yeah. But yeah. when he talks in the New Testament, it's soon. Yeah, that's true. I wonder if it, God, though he knew, I wonder if it didn't have to be long after he paid the price. He knew it would be, but I don't know if it had to be. Yeah, there's a plan A, right? And if we don't follow plan A, well, God's got a plan B. That's right. right? If we don't follow that, then he's got a plan C. And so I don't know how far down the line we had to go, but ultimately God's going to bring everything to pass. This is exactly right. And he knew exactly which plan we we're going to follow. With so, the goal, though, yeah. this is what's saying, not that he should perish, that's what you're saying, but the whole thing is he's waiting for Steve to mature, he's growing me up to do these things, and maybe maybe I have to influence some, some of my people that are around me so that they're there too yeah. and not lost, and there's just no way for me to know that. Like what he does. Steve's verse for today is Matthew 5, 48. Matthew 5, 48. That's, that's your verse for today. 48, 48 5, Matthew 5, 48. Let's see if you can uh, relate with this verse here. Matthew 5, 48. I think Steve's looking that verse up. 48? Uh-huh. What's it say there? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. You see, and that's God's plan for us. He's trying to develop the character of yes. Jesus in us, right? And that's called the process of sanctification. So, back in Daniel chapter 5, did uh, did God clearly tell his people ahead of time, as it says in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, what he was going to do? Absolutely. He was going to use the Medes and the Persians to conquer the Babylonians. And here... Belshazzar sees the writing on the wall. We'll start there in verse 25. This is the inscription that was written, right? <clears throat> what were the uh, letters that he saw on the wall? Mini, mini, tickle, Could it be you, Farson? Could it be that? You, Farson? You, Farson? You, Farson? Could it be that? Could be. You know, so we talked a little bit about this last time. The meaning, as you see, is a passive participle of the verb to number or to count. Uh, this is Aramaic that we're talking about here, this language. Uh, so this has been transliterated or, or actually uh, translated into English for us. Many, many. And then he says, tekel. This is uh, another uh, from the verb to lay. So we have to number and to weigh, and then you Farzan, notice what he says as he's given the explanation. In verse 26, this is the interpretation of each word. Many, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, why didn't he say you Farzan there? What's that? I was just going to ask that. Oh, why is there a different word? Okay. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So this is very interesting, this word. It's first in verse 25, uh, Eupharsin. And Eupharsin uh, is a plural noun. Okay. 
And so what he says on the wall, you farzan, the you is what's been transliterated from Aramaic into English. And in Aramaic, it's the word we would say and. So he's got two words stuck together. It's and farzan, right? It's you farzan, right? And, and farsin and, and is the same word. Then. Yeah. Well, well, farsin is the plural form of a Perez, right? And Perez is in the Aramaic. It uses the same letters, the consonants, as as the word for for the Persians. So not only is it does it mean in pieces or divided, or um, but it also means the Persians. And he actually says that, doesn't he? Your kingdom has been divided, put in pieces. That's that's what the word means in, in, in its uh, etymology or origin and given to the Medes and the Persians. So why was it maybe twice? In other words, only once. I don't know. That's a good question. I wonder why. Twice? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Get, their, get his attention. Anybody got any comments on that? Why would he have one word twice? You know, usually when Jesus it wants it's important. Yeah, this is important. Hear ye, hear ye, you have to say it twice. Yeah, that's true. Or sometimes you see, verily, verily, I say yes, it. Right, yeah. right. Whenever Jesus really wanted to have something that's really right. important. Any maybe that's the reason. This, you got, any, you got any insight on why they said meanie twice? Yeah. Any, yeah. I'm not sure either. Okay, well, there is two points to it, though, and that is that first off, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. So there's the point that that you know you have this many days, but then also it's done. You're done. So there's two points, at least for me. Yeah, maybe there is a, a meaning of of the dual meaning in there, because if you think about uh, Belshazzar was the second in command, wasn't he? He was first. His father? Yeah, his father. Nabba. Yeah. Yeah. Nabba. Yeah, Nabba. Nabba. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll call him Nabba. Nabonidus. That's Nabba. who it was, Nabonidus. He wasn't in Babylon at the time, but uh, Belshazzar was there, and that's why he couldn't give Daniel uh, second in the kingdom because Belshazzar was second, right? He only gave him third. And so here we have, maybe it's for him and his dad. Now, there is a, an ancient historian called uh, uh, Xenophon. He wrote that the, this, the king in Babylon at the time was destroyed, was killed by, and he even gave the name of the Persian that killed him. Um, so we know that Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he surrendered and wasn't killed. So that's another confirmation that Belshazzar was the one that died how do you know that, Pastor? Uh, we, we had the ancient writings of this. Of this, uh, we had the writings of this ancient historian. So they Xenophon. That one. Yeah, do you know what I'm talking about? No, I was just okay. got another guy. Okay. So I was just thinking about the second angel's message. It says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. His fallen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a dual, a dual meaning there, Paul. Yeah, that's a good point. So, Pastor, they. Captured Babylon and then they went over and captured the city that the father was in. Yes, that's correct. Tima, because he worshipped the moon god. You know, his his mother was a priestess of the moon moon worship. So that was part of the Babylonian Empire. It was city. part of the Babylonian Empire, but he surrendered, and then he was put in uh, exile. So he wasn't killed by the Persians. Did these guys have access to Jonah <clears throat> before this time? The reason why I ask that is, you know, here God is announcing this to everyone on the wall, right? Well, the fact is, if you repent, things change. Yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> this guy gets this it's done. Amazing. He yeah. gets this done, and this day he dies. There's no repentance there. Right. And I but think he shows. It's finished. It's finished. The probation had already closed. He passed right? his time. Right. Well, and God knows that. But I'm just saying... So you let's know, talk in the about case it. of Nineveh, God said, hey, you guys are done. Yeah, yeah. But then they repented, hoping that God would change his mind. And That's he true. Did. If you look at the message of Jonah. It wasn't that 
if they turn around and repent, they're going to... That's the thing about Jonah, which is really interesting to me, because he doesn't say if, does it? He just yeah. says, you're going to be destroyed in 40 yeah. days. You're going to be destroyed in 40 days. So right? evil, you're going to be declared. Yeah, you're going to be destroyed in 40 days. That's right. Same with Noah. Yeah, same with Noah, right? He preached 120 years, and they were all destroyed. But with Nineveh... Yeah. God changed his mind. Exactly. Yeah. They repented. Yes. For a hundred years or so. Huh? Yeah, that's correct. They were they were finally defeated and destroyed in uh seven uh let's see, uh six six twelve, I think when they were finally defeated and destroyed. So. I think repentance has to do with uh you know not being sorry for getting caught, but being sorry and saying God is right, you know, and what he does. So when when uh it's like Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. When someone's truly repentant, they say, okay, I've done wrong. God's going to kill me. That's, so that's be right. Yeah. And, and I'm still that's repentant. Good. I still acknowledge that he's right. And and uh, and whatever he does, uh, as opposed to uh, he's not just in doing this to me. No. That's a good point. We have parallels here. I think uh, one of the ones brought up was... Uh, we are when we look at ancient Babylon, it helps us understand the prophecy given about the future Babylon or mystic or spiritual Babylon here at the end of time. And uh, Scott brought that up. We have other parallels here too. We have this idea of judgment, right? I mean, there's a judgment process, and ultimately, God brings things to a final end. And we have a choice in this judgment process that we can cooperate with God, he changes our hearts and prepares us for heaven, or we can harden our heart like Belshazzar did, and then he was he was destroyed, right? Look at David. <clears throat> yeah? He completely turned around. Yeah? And, and, yeah? I love the story of David because, you know, he's so sorry, right, when we pants and sackcloth and all that stuff, but then once his son dies, yeah, okay, <laughs> move on. Yeah, yeah, Next. yeah. And yeah. you know, I think we can learn from that, too. Yeah, we yeah. can say, look, you know, I've done what I could. You don't know if God's going to change his mind. Yeah, there's you nothing more I can do. Uh, so let's look to the future, right? Yeah. When Saul, when when Samuel told Saul he was going to lose the kingdom, yeah, he still was allowed to continue in his position. And he could have said, could. God is righteous. Yeah. It'll be that way. I'll still serve him, even though he's taken the kingdom. That's amen, right. amen. And he didn't say it. He didn't do that. It could have had a different outcome. He didn't accept that God. He didn't accept God's judgment. That's true. He just kept. The same way, you know, he was before, and 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 if he had repented, that doesn't mean he would get to keep, keep the kingdom. Right. Doesn't mean he would keep salvation, keep communion with God, which is better than the kingdom. You know? Yeah. But he he uh, keep his soul. <clears throat> exactly. So we see a theme throughout the book of Daniel of judgment, don't we? We see this idea of judgment given in the book of Daniel. And we ourselves are going to experience judgment, aren't we? Right? Where does it say that we all are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ? What's it? I, I wouldn't think of that one, but it might be. We may have a hint there too, Scott. I was thinking of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. We have somebody read that one. See, see if the one in John uh, matches up with that. Scott, if it does, uh, shout it out to us. Who has 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10? And what I'm bringing about that we see in, in Daniel chapter 5 is, let's, let's don't just look at it as an ancient history, right? Now, let's look at it as this is the way God works. And this also is going to be applied in my own life. Because Malachi 3, 6 says that God changes not. And so I think we have to respect that when we study the Word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, it says that the things written in the Old Testament or for our examples and admonition on whom the ends of the ages have come. So it's written for people here at the end of time. So we need to learn the message. Now what does it say in 2 Corinthians 5.10? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that, he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Did you find the verse you were thinking of, Scott? Yeah, well, it was John 5, 29. It's talking about the resurrection. Oh, the resurrection. Okay, okay. 
All right. So uh, this idea that we're going to, is that scary to you guys? No. Oh. Because they're going to see what Jesus did. Yeah, when they yeah. look at my record, they see what Jesus did, what I did. Yeah, I'm going to be looking pretty awesome. I, I think that's a pretty good comment there. <laughs> what are you putting your trust in? Yeah. Right? You're going to appear before the judge of the universe. What are you putting your trust in? Are you putting it in your own good works? Right. Or your own motives? Or your own life? Or are you going to put your trust in Christ's righteous life? I, I, I love the experience with Peter, where Jesus is talking to him. Peter, you love me? Mm. Well, yes, I love you. And he asked him again, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. And finally, the third time, Lord, you know. How? It's not what Peter thinks and feels yeah. about whether he's saved or not that matters. It matters what God. And so you go and you're in your say, Jesus, hey, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up, Stephen, because uh, Jesus said to Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, I phileo you. And then he says, do you agape me? And Peter said, no, I phileo you. He uses two different Greek words for love, right? There's four Greek words for love, right? And so agape is the unconditional love. Phileo is the brotherly type love, right? And so then the, the third time, Jesus says, do you phileo me? He goes, yeah, I phileo you. <laughs> so it says Philadelphia, right? We get that brother, city of brotherly love. Um, it's interesting how he didn't put any confidence that he could generate this agape love. Right. So he, he was humble at this point in time and said, that's the kind of love I want, right. but I, I can only get that love from you. That's right. It doesn't come from me. And it's the same for each one of us. And it's beautiful, isn't it? So each one of us are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, aren't we? And we <laughs> yeah. What's that? You're saying Christ is kind of looking to see if he would boast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you putting trust in yourself? Or are you putting trust in, in me? Right. Yeah. Before he was like that, he was kind of boast. Oh, yeah. I'm Oh yeah, look, I, I'm, in. I'm I'm all the way, you know. I'm I'm picking up the sword. And I'm, if you're gonna die, I'm gonna die, right? right. Yeah, he denied it, <laughs> so he had this opportunity. But then he 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 started to distrust himself. I think that's we can learn right. a lot about that. Yeah, that's right. We should do the same thing. Yes, that's not just for Peter. It was for the disciples too to see this change in Peter. That's exactly right. Amen. They saw. They knew he denied the Lord three times, and here now he has come back and given an opportunity three times to say that uh, he was really repentant. Wasn't right. That's right. Yeah, that's the key. Isn't it? And it's also he, he refused to take the prophet of the God. I guess to say I got, I got that he would even take the prophet of, of being God. Right. Exactly. And, and even if because only agape love only comes from God, we can't generate it. Right. right. And even if you're lost, the story's the same. He tried. He did everything he could to save me. And if he, if Jesus announced me, depart from me, I never knew you. <laughs> Sorry. But he did everything he could to try to know me, but with my hard heart, it's the same. It's still, he's right. He's right. Yeah, amen, amen. Um, that reminds me of uh, Philippians chapter 2, where we all are going to bow the knee and say, you know, Christ right. is right. That's Raymond, right. we're going to do you first, and then Pat. So on Second Corinthians five ten. So is is that essentially Christ judging Christ if we have the robe of righteousness, or is that literally any many mighty mo? Because like if he's our first of all, who's judging? Who's judging who? I I mean, what what is this all about? I think that it is more like the the universe and. And the evil angels uh, had the accusation to begin with, right? And so who's really on trial? And, and who's really getting judged there? Pat, what's your comment? The so it's interesting, 2 Corinthians 5.10 is talking about a, there's three phases to the judgment, right? And he's covering all three phases in one verse. Mm. So that's what we have to be careful about, isn't it? So you remember the judgment is divided up into the pre-advent, right? 
or we could say uh, investigative. You might hear that. Uh, and when we say pre-advent, we're talking about before second coming, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have that judgment is taking place. And then we have this millennial judgment that takes place. And then uh, post-millennial. Or we could say great white throne. <clears throat> Right, so we have three phases, and uh, this line here represents the second coming of Christ, okay? And this line here, we'll call it, for lack of a better term, the third coming. And, uh, of course, this is a thousand years, and this is talked about in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, the great white throne is talked about in Revelation chapter 20. I won't get into a lot of the detail, but what I want to focus on is the pre-advent judgment or the investigative judgment you see if you don't understand the state of the dead you don't under you, this just you totally don't see this there's no point to yeah it. yeah you, you totally don't see that can say that the judgment first begin in the house of god that's it so let's look that verse up It is, uh, and help me out, uh, Bill. It's going to either be some strange reason. Is it 1 Peter 4, I get First Peter and James. I, I, I get chapter 4 of those mixed up with each other. And I can't keep them straight in my head because I've done this for, for decades. So I'm kind of giving up. I'm trying to keep them straight. So First Peter chapter 4, verse 17, right? Okay. What's it say there? Would you read it for Scott? For the time is come. That judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So this pre-advent judgment is only for uh it's only for believers. Any believer who has lived down through time. The pre-advent judgment is only for believers. We're going to get into that in more detail in Daniel chapter 7. I'm really looking forward to Daniel 7. You're not going to want to miss Daniel 7. It, it, it's, it's just awesome. Uh, we're going through Daniel 7 with some of Jeremy's friends right now. And, and what, what, what do you think some of their comments are about Daniel 7? It's just phenomenal. What, do you, what are they saying there? Well, it's, I mean, they've never studied Daniel 7 before. Just based off of what they've been taught traditionally in other churches it's eye-opening so it's it's uh that's why it's good to study the bible for yourself exactly out of all the studies we've had i would say it's probably the one they're just they're kind of glued or most engaged or really got their attention is daniel 7 so we're 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 going to get daniel 7 here just shortly of course <laughs> we're going to finish up five today and get into six but i want you to see that here we have this idea of judgment through the book of Daniel. And, uh, you know, Daniel chapter 3, what did you have? You had uh, this judgment process taking place. Uh, if you don't bow down to the statue, then I'm going to throw you in, this, in the fire. And, of course, God intervenes and saves them in a miraculous way. Uh, and 4, there was a judgment uh, specifically for Nebuchadnezzar, right? If you don't humble your heart, you're going to lose your kingdom. And, of course, he did for seven years. Here we are in 5. Judgment takes place. Uh, Bel Belshazzar and the kingdom of Avalon is, is found wanting, and they're come to an end. Uh, and so God intervenes and uses the Medes and the Persians. What's interesting about this, judgment takes place, but there is an end. It's going to end, right? Somewhere right here before the second coming, this pre-advent judgment is going to end. And we, as believers in Christ, have our names written in the book of life, and it's only the people's names written in the book of life who are going to be involved in the pre-advent judgment. Notice what it says in John chapter 3, verse 18, about people who don't believe. What, what's that, Scott? They're judged already. Yeah, they're judged already, it says. 
So John 3.18, he said, there's no need for them to go through an investigative judgment if they haven't accepted Christ, if they're not a believer in the one true God, regardless of what you call him, because there's different names, right? If you don't accept the Redeemer, the Messiah, the Christ, and become a believer, you're not going to be involved in this pre-advent judgment process because you're lost already. There's no need for you to be in that. It's only people whose names are written in the book of life. Do you have a, a, a mental image of what that looks like going on up there right now? I mean, is it just Jesus talking with the Father about it? I think we could read it. I think we could read it. I think we could read it. Uh, we'll jump ahead a little bit. We'll come back to it in detail when we go to Daniel 7. But since you want to bring up an image of it, let's go to Daniel 7, 9, and 10. Okay? Daniel 7, what? 9 and 10. <clears throat> we need somebody to read it in your preaching voice. All right? Let's have somebody read Daniel 7, 9, and 10 in your preaching voice. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. For, for me, books. though, that mental image counts for all. In other words, I don't think it's changed. Up there where the Heavenly Father sits on his throne isn't going to change. Probably a billion years ago, it looked the same <laughs> as it does now. I don't know if there's I, I think it's on. a little different. I think because... But the well, judge, well, the book's being opened is, is different. Well, it's the location of the throne. Well, that's true. That's good to change. Yeah, because uh, that's why we study it, it, the uh, the sanctuary service there in the Old Testament. Um, we have in the sanctuary service, why is there so much detail about the sanctuary service in the Bible, even referred to in the New Testament, heavy in the book of Hebrews, heavy yeah. in the book of Revelation, right? right? Why do we have all that? That was understand what the salvation process right. in this, this pre-advent judgment, right? And so in 1798, right. God the Father goes into the most holy place and sets up for the judgment. Right. And then if you notice in Daniel chapter 7, look in verse uh, 13 and 14. What's it say about now God the Son? See, the ancient of days is God the Father. That's Daniel 7, 9, and 10. And then God the Son, because notice it talks about his throne having wheels. So he moves from the holy place in the heavenly sanctuary to the most holy place in 1798. And then Jesus comes but a few years later. What bill you got that for us? 13 and 14. 13 and 14, yeah. In my, night, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, sovereign power. All peoples, nations, men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So in 1798, we see God the Father starting the process of this pre-advent judgment. And then in 1844, we have God the Son, Jesus, coming into the most holy place to start the process. Now, where do I get these dates? That's why we're going to study Daniel chapter 7. Okay? And we'll go into that in detail. I want to show you that now there is a pre-Edwin judgment process going on in heaven that started in the year 1844. And it ends sometime right before the second coming. We don't know when it ends, because we don't know the date of the second coming, right? People have thought they did. Yeah, that's, they were. True. that's true. That's <laughs> true. But going back to Second Corinthians, uh, it says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and obviously we are not currently appearing in person uh, there. 
So is that referring to this figuratively, or is that referring to later on when we're actually standing before the throne? Or do you well, think that Jesus is representing me? Or yeah, is, it, is it the fact that we're being re represented? We're, we're being represented, right, as believers in Christ. Our, our lives are brought up before the, the judgment seat of Christ and the pre epic <laughs> judgment. So we're not there yet, right? But this is all in the context of the infamous absent from the body verse. Yeah. So yes. it's right. talking about something beyond just being represented in heaven, right? Like, right, it is. And that's why it covers this whole broad spectrum of three phases of the judgment. Right. Because in the great white throne judgment, they physically, the wicked physically appears before the judgment seat of Christ and they're condemned. Wanting. Right, but they they get their day in court as well, but they're condemned, and so that's why you have us appearing as our lives in heaven uh, have been recorded, right, right? In, in, in the book of life. But then you have the the ones who have turned away, because some of the believers get blotted out of the book of life, right? What's the verse that talks about blotting out believers? The ones who have. The ones who have turned away. That's why we don't believe in one second to always say, because you have the free will to turn away right. from Christ at any time. Right? right? So, Raymond. So, what was that a couple weeks ago when you talked about James, like the book of James, and how Mark Luther had a real challenge with that? And that's, yeah. I guess, in my mind, that's what I'm, I'm thinking right now. James versus, like, Romans 7. And this... this Judgment. Which one is it? Is it is it Raymond that 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 had a bad day, or is it Raymond that Jesus is enough, and I'm being judged through the lens of Jesus, Romans, or am I getting judged by Raymond had a bad so, day? So no so let's talk about let's talk about two that. two two different things that are taking place. Okay, yeah. salvation. The only reason. You can be saved. The only reason you can walk through the pearly gates of the New Jerusalem, the only reason you can get into heaven is because of Christ's good works. Sure. Your good works add absolutely nothing to your salvation. Even if even if I just sin once. Yeah, yeah. So let's start there. Yeah, yeah. The even guy, if the guy who's only sinned once. The guy that's only sinned once still 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 deserves right? death. Yep. Yeah, he still deserves to die. He doesn't deserve to walk through into the pearly gates, right? The guy that only sinned once still deserves death. Well, weren't we born in sin? That's unfair. Sin when we were the one. Yeah. yeah that, David addresses this in Psalm 51, doesn't he? He says, in sin, my mother deceived me, right? right. And so, so, in other words, we, you don't even have to do one we don't have sin. sin. Because we're born with a nature that loves right. sin. Right. right? Pleasure. And that's why we have, we have to have Christ save us. Right. We can't save ourselves, right? right? And so the only reason you get to go into heaven is because of Jesus' good works. It's called his righteousness, right? That's the only reason. If he shed his blood on the cross to suffer the penalty we deserve so that we could have eternal life, right? Our sins could be forgiven and cleansed because he shed his blood on the cross. But the reason we get into heaven is because of his good works. We are saved by his life, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So right. this has more to do with like what floor you are on the mansion. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> no, reward of not, your, your no. ocean view. Now we're getting into backyard. we're getting into Mormon theology here. <laughs> 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 you know, the Mormons believe there are different levels of heaven. The, they have the terrestrial, the celestial, and the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Making up words. No, no, they, that's, the accident, that's what they came up with. They, they made up those words. Right? They came up with the words, right? And so they have these three different levels. Uh, but no, it's not that way. Uh, the the reason you're judged by what in Second Corinthians five ten? What does it say? He's judging you on. Your works. Are the choices we've made? Yeah. So look in Matthew chapter sixteen verse twenty seven. Revelation chapter 22, verses uh, 11, and, and can, we, can we go to 12 too? Okay. So what was the first verse you gave us? What? Matthew chapter 16. 16, verse 27. Well, notice what he says there. This is right before the Mount of Transfiguration. The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his work. Yeah. 
All right. So what does it say in uh, reward every man according to his what? Works. Do you see why uh, why our works come into the judgment process is because we are rewarded according to our works. We're not talking about salvation. No. We're talking about a reward. Right. That's right. That's it's different. Right. That's different. Right. Isn't he right? bringing the reward with him? Right, right. We're going to get rewarded. Sounds like that. Because it says, receive, uh, receive according to what you've done. Well, right. Sounds like the same as uh, Matthew. Exactly. You're, you're, you're talking about Revelation chapter 22? What verse are you talking about? No, Matthew uh, 16, 27. Oh, you're comparing the, the 2 Corinthians 5, 10 with Matthew 16, 27. Yes. Exactly, right. Jeremy? So how I read 2 Corinthians 5, 10, I think you said this last week, and I read it in my Bible. You're saved by grace through faith. You're saved by grace through faith. You're judged by what you do, by your works. That's right. And those things right. are linked. If you have faith in Jesus Christ and put all your faith and trust in Him, then the things that we, our output will show that, and that's the James part, right? Faith without works is dead, right? If you have the faith, right? And you have the new birth in you. Then you're going, if you have your faith in Jesus, right. then you're, you're, you're going to be born again and you're going to have works that represent his character, right? And you are going to be rewarded according to your works, but that has nothing to do with salvation. Right. Your salvation is... Be because you put your trust fully in Jesus. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. There's two different aspects here. Lori? Um, you know, Ellen White says it's not by your occasional deed, misdeed, or, or you yeah. know, good deed that, that your your salvation is based upon. It's kind of like what you say, it's your focus. And it, I kind of think of it as, like, which direction are you going on the mountain? Yeah. And if you're Even if you're on the mountain and you're going up and you fall, you're still, when you get up, you're still higher than you were before. And you're still in that same direction. So your your focus is what direction are you going? You know, like Raymond said, it's not if you fall on the mountain, it's which direction on the mountain are you going? When you have a life of sin and you're going down, even when you fall, you're farther down, and that's why sin always costs more than what you're thinking you're willing to pay, because it, if you fall it's going to take you even farther than what you expected to go. That's a good point. I think it's even Maybe. better news than that. I think you've saved uh, in the, what direction do you want to be? Let's say I'm climbing the mountain, I get caught in a rock slide, but my desire hasn't changed. I think it's even better news, and I think I'm saved on what like direction that. I want I like to be. That. Yeah, that's a good point. Exactly. Look at the thief on the cross. You know, he, he saved the cause. He put his faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any didn't have any good works either way, right? That he can he could bring to the table, uh, but he's saved because he put his his uh, <coughs> faith in Christ. We're saved the same way. Right? That's a parable of the ones that got paid. The workers. Yes, they got they all got paid what? The same. The same. Wow. Yeah, the same. Because uh, it, it, here's the beautiful thing about this other parable that talks about we got we got to finish up. The parable where the king goes in and, and inspects the guest in the wedding feast. Yeah. What is he looking for? Yeah. Jesus is the robe. robe. The robe, right? That is the judgment. That is it. It's the same thing. That, that's that's what he's looking for in the judgment is, are you wearing the robe? Right? right? Are you clothed for the wedding? Yes. Are you wearing the robe? And the robe is Christ's good works. You've accepted those on behalf of your Self, right? I, I think too that takes Jesus because we can, can take the robe off after we've had it. Yeah. It takes a God who can tell us something that's going to happen 150 years later to know whether or not if He declares me. So when I'm there and I'm in the judgment seat, I'm good. But I'm not that. I'm not good because of what I did. I just happened to be. He already kept. He already prejudged me as being good enough to be there because of what I've accepted in Christ. But right. I think that with that freedom of knowing that I'm God's kid and that um, the robe is covering me, what do I do with that? Yeah. Do I go yeah, on maybe. sinning or do I, knowing that the, it covers me, oh, it's covered me, so yeah, I'll go ahead and do this? Or do I make a choice of covering me? I'm God's kid. I'm the king's kid and I'm going to act. 
like a king's kid and I'm going right, to do this right, because right. I'm a king's kid. Right. Exactly. Right. I think it has a lot to do with what you do with that and the choices that you make once the rope is on you. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you that we can have the robe of Christ's righteousness Amen. on each one of us. Mm -hmm. A gift by faith. As it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 22. And Father, we accept that gift. When our name comes up in the pre-advent judgment, we want just the good goodness, the righteousness, the good works of Jesus to be seen on our account, on our behalf, because we put our trust in him. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, happy Sabbath. Thanks for coming to Sabbath School. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. Will you ask that? Question and when we do Daniel chapter seven, because it won't take us long to get to Daniel, Daniel chapter seven. It's a great question.